Guys, welcome on. Um, it's been uh, a minute in the making. I don't know if that's the saying, but I'm going to roll with it. That's uh, I'm going to coin that one. But um, yeah, I think getting straight into it, what Itch Pig means to me, guys. Like when I was I was at De La Salle, a uh, all boys school here in Melbourne, and uh, there's a few boys on that willy line that would come down uh, when we were you know 14, and I'd see these Itch Pig jumpers. You know they're wearing them over their over their out, their uniforms. Blazers. And, yeah, teachers don't love that. But anyway. Um, Blazer. Yeah, the, the blazer. I've forgotten about the blazer. Wear your blazer. Um, but, uh, <laughs> your shirt. Yeah, it was all of that. But um, yeah, those different panels, like colours, like definitely captured my imagination. And yeah, I was just so fascinated. And I didn't even know where William Sam was when I was like 13, 14, you know, being like a yuppie on the other side of town. But yeah, they really just kind of gave me that. Oh, to be honest, it really, I think because it was so homegrown, I was like, shit, like there's these guys out in Melbourne, like doing shit that's like one-on-one, capturing imaginations, creative as fuck. And that for me was like a real stepping stone into me kind of seeing that you can achieve shit out of your garage, you know, and it, you don't need to be, you don't need to be a, with a fashion degree or like all these like official things. It's like, just get, go get started. So yeah, just want to say thanks for uh, get, capturing that imagination of mine when I was a little fella. Welcome, man. Thank you. <laughs> we, we had a mate, how we found out about you guys. One of our good mates at high school was wearing one of your jumpers. And there was a few boys, as Jesse said. But we were like, oh, what was the process of getting the jumper? And he's like, man, you just rock up at these two guys' garage. And you like they just open the garage and you're in there. It's all custom. And we're like, what? It just sounded like Insane. something completely foreign to us at the time. But so cool. I'd love to you guys to maybe take it back to those days when you first started in that garage what did it what did it look like probably not much bigger than this it was sort of what three by three by three three by four yeah meters. three by three by seven just like a pretty like mum had a pretty small car that just fit in mm. it it was like a coupe and it just fit in it so no, it's pretty it was yeah. a pretty tight space yeah double brick roller door um low ceiling pretty like claustrophobic in there yeah it and was huh yeah me and nate i mean we're sort of on the larger side of average person so we're already filling the space out a little bit and yeah balaclavas because we just wanted an anonymity about the brand mm. and we want customers to be able to envision themselves in the products that they were customizing themselves so we wore balaclavas so you'd bang on a roller door and come pick up your custom hoodie and there'd be me and him in balaclavas give you yeah give it you was jumper wild. and that was that was it that was our first customer interactions for probably two or three years wow. and we would like we would like tee up times like like um like so that we knew when the customers were coming, we knew we would be there. So often you would time it so that y you knew you had to be there before the customer or you'd get there after the customer. And like a lot of the times I was coming, I was coming like directly from uni. So I'd be driving down the main streets of like Willie, like with a balaclava on. Just Yeah, we always had balaclavas in our, <laughs> in our car at any moment. Like if one of us yeah. was rocking up and a customer was already there. At the garage, we'd have to put our belly on in the car and then come out. So we're, yeah. real, we're real crazy about the anonymity. We were like, yeah. we were super gnarly about super it. Super gnarly, yeah. Yeah, no one, no one knew it was us for ages. Yeah. Like, like literally years. The only people that knew were our close friends. That was it. It was like, I remember going to Newport Skate Park a couple of times and like, yeah, I'd see the eyes kind of look at me and they, I think that's the each big guy. But no one actually knew and everyone would just stare at me. It was, it was really interesting. It was also because we were so focused on just product. Like Nate came from industrial design background and I was fine arts in painting. So we just really had a focus and an emphasis on product. We didn't really have any marketing background. So we just spent... <laughs> Still don't. Yeah, so we just spent every second <laughs> just thinking about designing the best products that we could. Mm. And so we didn't really want the lay or layers or levels of like owners being involved in that product experience. So it really was just make the craziest, wildest product that you could and then the rest will do the rest. And, and it worked. Because yeah. look, the, 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 <laughs> like, you know, you, you described it. You said, I saw these crazy hoods. Mm. They were made in Melbourne in this garage. I didn't know nothing about them, but it inspired me. It wanted me to make find out more, right? Mm. It, it worked. It was crazy. And, and it was funny. It's funny how I know, we, we know that, that that thinking happened. You know, we would a jumper would sell into a school and it would just spread like wildfire throughout the school because of that that experience, that thing you're talking about. But it's crazy. Every time you hear it, you're like, it reaffirms what we thought was happening. Yeah. It was just a really interesting kind of experiment. It was, man. I, I think... And it worked. 
It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, you guys have been at this for 13 years as well. And it's just like to go back then and look at that. Yeah, I'm, I've... It's yeah, it's just really. It's funny that this whole chat is just really bringing up some of those old memories, like in the schoolyard, the colours as well, like you know, yeah, the, the yeah, teals yeah. and the, the, they were just like that grey, yeah. I, and of course, this is all before social media. This is like start of Facebook type of thing, start of Instagram. Yeah, yeah, it was right at the start of Instagram. I remember Facebook was Facebook was kind of what Instagram probably used to be. Well, probably Facebook was probably what TikTok is now. Mm. You know, it was it was booming. It was, you know, you'd post something on there and it, it would go crazy like you get heaps of comments heaps of interactions but and and instagram was just kind of coming along but yeah it was it was just i remember just yeah the people coming in and the the photos and you would put the photos up on the facebook we'd tag the person in and i want that i want that and they it was wild it's funny today those things are kind of called seeding or Mm. influencer marketing yeah it's almost like you guys were doing it without even knowing you Mm. were doing it and through a facebook account by all court, like you yeah, were just operating a Facebook account called Itch Pig. Yeah, no, Pig. worse, we were running an account called Jerry Swinefeld. <laughs> yeah. We weren't even running Under an account code, called no. Itch Pig. Yeah. People just knew you had to follow Jerry Swinefeld on Facebook to get your hands on Itch Pig clothes. And I would deny people ex- like adding the fate. Like if I didn't know who you were, I, I wouldn't accept the friend request and therefore you couldn't buy it because this was back when websites weren't accessible either. Like we didn't have a website for four or five years. It's It's... um. So you were very much curating your customer and your audience. Yeah, 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 yeah. For two or three years, yeah. You, it, was, it really was if you know, you know. And that's just because of our interests in sneakers. And, I mean, even ESPN, like, coming from a sporting background, like, if we wanted to watch the NBA, we had to go to a mate's house out of Foxtel because mm. we did it. <laughs> or, so, or, like, I used to I used to watch on, um like, just, like, before League Pass was invented. Like, now I'm addicted to League Pass, right? But before that, like... I used to go on Fox Sports News and they'd have these little updates, these these like minute notes, and it would say one minute one, Ginobili steals ball, score is this. <laughs> one minute oh two, Ginobili shoots ball, misses. Like it would and I would literally refresh it while I was at school. I'd watch this thing like I was addicted to it. That's yeah. Insane. So it was a big if you know you know concept, which is why the ESPN typeface is so heavily inspired by our strike logo typeface, because yeah. we wanted to call upon that if you know you know concept. Also and with your sizing as well, right? Yeah, yeah, at the start, PG point guard was our that. size small. Yeah. C you guys center. have done some research. Good yeah. shit. Well, fuck. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. It's funny, like you know, just in the schoolyard, be like, you'd look at the tag and it's like a PG. Like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, like it was every element of that garment was different. And yeah. yeah, it was. It really was. Mm. Everything was. Even the even the grades were like. I remember when you know, because we used to go to the manufacturers and we still do, but like we would go there and spend hours just looking at patterns, figuring out grades. And even our first grade was, and, and that was the reason we, we came up with the, um, the point guard, uh, sm- uh, the, the basketball sizes or whatever, was because our grading and our sizes were just so different. Like <laughs> we only did three sizes. Yeah, our manufacturers like, look, you can't really call these small, medium, large because they're kind of not. <laughs> so if you do, it's going to really throw people off. So we're mm. like, all right, well, we'll call them something else. We'll call them the five basketball positions yeah. because we that. were so into basketball and ESPN. And so we're just like, done. That's and, what we'll do. and because we didn't have much capital when we started, like, you know, Alex has often said, and we both said in previous podcasts that, you know, we basically started this thing with 500 bucks from me and 500 bucks from Alex cut costs we just did small medium and large so we only for the first like long time we only ever offered point guard small forward and center because (laughs) that was the small medium double xl and the grade jumps between those sizes were like in some cases it was like 10 centimeters added length yeah like nowadays like you know you don't do that now the grading was the grading was crazy but like insane it was not small we could do whatever we wanted you know we were just completely creating things that we wanted to create we would Mm. Just every every element of the brand we were influencing. For sure. It was just different. Man. I was going to say, yeah, obviously everything comes from that being different. Like that was the main, it sounds like the core kind of foundation, um, inspiring change, inspiring a difference. And obviously it sounds like that lasted for about two to three years. You guys were doing every hoodie was a one-on-one. Am I mm. correct in saying that? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. different panels, colouring, didn't make the same hood twice for three or four years, yeah. Which is insane. Like hundreds of orders a week. Yeah. People wouldn't realize how crazy that is on the surf. That is fucking incredible that you mm. guys could do that for three to four years. Mm. Even just the amount of color variance, and I'm sure you guys, you know, you weren't using a hundred different colors. You probably had three or four, and you were just changing it up. Pretty much. Like, <laughs> I mean, that's where, I guess, for Alex and I, it's like our, our deep, 
our deep interest in so many different things like you know nature fucking sport skating surfing snowboarding whatever like there's so many things that we're plugged into that feed us those things mm. like yeah the colorways are everywhere and our manufacturers that were buying the dead stock stuff from the colors they couldn't sell like they were great colors for us because teals purples blacks now you got mighty ducks and so <laughs> if they couldn't sell those colors we were like we'll take them. So we're getting great price on all these dead stock blanks. And then we would just deconstruct them and put them back together. And then we were just being, table. and then we were just being like, yeah, but just because we were the actual doers, we could affect change because, you know, you basically got the person that's, you know, paying for the stuff, designing the stuff and then making stuff. That's, that was just us. Mm. So it's like, we could react to trends and, and things that were actually happening like that. Like, you know, yeah, like, if a new sneaker came out, we'd have a colorway, that that day yeah. well even even like even si- something as simple as you know like games game seven between spurs and phoenix in i think it was like 2006 or something like that like i'm a diehard spurs fan but we're just like fuck it we've got some orange and purple let's make a phoenix colorway to celebrate game seven and let's auction it off on f- facebook and that's what we did mm. how long on average did it take you to make a hoodie out of the garage when everything was set up, so all the parts are set up, we've got our sleeves separate over there, our hood pieces over there, pocketing over there. You get one out in under an hour. Wow. Shit. Yeah. We got pretty efficient at it because that's the the other, maybe, is unique the right word? I don't know. But that's one aspect of what Alex and I are is we're, 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 we, we can design process and think our way through problem solving, especially coming from me because of the industrial design thing, uh, the industrial design degree that I did. One thing that my brain does look at is finding the pattern and then making it more efficient of which so you know you guys are doing four years of that and it's probably not the most efficient process from like a scaling perspective like you're probably fuck no it was horrible <laughs> it was t- totally horrible we had this room by the end of it by the time custom i mean basically custom the the waters burst on it right like it was just it just became unmanageable yeah, yeah it got up to like you know 100 orders a week custom hoodies like it was 100 hours, 100 hours, <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah, it's gone. So, like, we it was really working really good at, like, 20, 30, 40 orders a week. Once it got to 100 a week, we we're like, okay, they're starting to get a lot of people that are wanting the same hoodie. They're wanting that colorway, but just different variations. And then we started to see the pattern. We're like, okay, there's sort of, like, a handful, maybe a dozen different colorways here that are scalable. Yeah. And then we started to produce a ready-made line. We'd pick a couple of heavy hitters. Mm. And we'd produce small units still, but then it'd sell out that night. So we're like, okay, we need to produce a ready-made line. And in between that, like looking for inefficiencies, like we can't keep taking orders if we're on the machine sewing. You literally can't type while you're on a machine. So that was one of the first scalabilities is, you know, finding machinists to do the sewing for us. And then we scaled that out and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then Alex, like Alex said, we started seeing the pattern. So then we would try and make, you know, like 20 of a, a Washington hood because Wizards were playing uh, Celtics one year or something. So we would we would make that colorway 20 times or whatever. But again, the problem was is managing the stock that fueled that was just a nightmare because you think about it from a logistics standpoint, like you guys have just dealt with your container coming in, right? Mm-hmm. What we were dealing with was not only are you dealing with a whole hoodie, you then break it apart into its arms, its torso, its hood parts, its ribbon cuff, you times that by five for the sizes, then times that by, say, 15 for colours. You're talking about managing loose parts that mm. are just floating around in this oh, right. in this room. And then so you'd have your sleeves over in that area. You'd have your, It was like a McDonald's. You've got your <laughs> buns, your lettuces, and you just do a circle around this huge cutting table. Yeah. And you'd grab your purple sleeve, your black hoodie, your this, and you'd just do this lap. And then you'd bundle it up. That's one bundle. Chuck it in the thing. Do another lap for the next order. You pick up the order sheet. Next lap, next lap, next lap. You just do 100 laps until you've made 100 custom bundles. Take the bundles off to the sewer. It was mental. And then you get things where like purple and teal and orange, all the poppy colors, they sell really well in ribs and sleeves. Mm. But then all your torso colors are neutrals because everyone just wants it. Because everyone's neutral black. Torso. Mm. Right. So then your neutral colors are cr- selling like crazy on the torsos. But then the other colors are selling like crazy on the sleeves. How do you keep the... Yeah, you got like the yeah. It was mental. So once it got to hundred orders, we're like, let's bring in a ready made line and then that sort of put the lid on things, which was, was good. Was that a hard decision to make? Coming from being one of ones, fully custom. It was really hard. It was one of the yeah. I mean, there's there's probably a few like notable points in the brand where there's like crossroad decisions. That was probably the fir- that was one of the first ones. Yeah. 
Yeah, one of the, yeah, definitely bringing in custom. I think uh, sorry, bringing in ready made was kind of something that you know through my uni course I identified that was something that needed to happen, and then Alex, Alex was, I kind of talked my way through it, and then. I was unsure of it and Alex was the one that said, no, I think this is the right call and we kind of followed your lead on that. But like that was probably easier than the decision to remove custom. Removing custom was ch- mm. challenging because at the time, you know, you're talking about how old were we? Maybe 24 and 25, 24, 25 Yeah, maybe a bit younger. But by this stage, you know, the custom thing had gotten pretty well known. It was well known and it was starting to make us some money and it probably represented between 30 and 50% of our, our rev. Mm. Um, so the decision to cut that out was challenging. We basically lit 30 to 50% of our rev on fire and mm. said, sorry, we're not doing it anymore. We can't, we can't do it. It's, it's because you're talking about, yeah, you're providing a service, but there's all this back end stuff bef- behind it about, you know, I was gonna say you probably opened up 90% of your time though, by getting rid of that. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it was a hard decision to make because it was like, it was so us and so where we came from. So it was built it's on DNA. DNA. Yeah, it was our yeah. DNA. We yeah. basically basically said, oh, our DNA is not relevant anymore. And it was Well, DNA was panelling, right? And then the panelling sort of went through the custom era. And then we tried our best to take that panelling back into ready-made. But now it was challenging because people wanted that panelling in one of ones. They didn't necessarily want that panelling in like one of 200. So you, that's where things became problematic. Did you see that from customers? Were they like, oh, fuck, I don't want to buy this because this is one of, you know, a thousand, yeah. one of a hundred? Well, interestingly, what we saw a lot was we actually started seeing people wanting, I want all the paneling, but I want every panel black. Mm-hmm. And we're like, oh, so you're trying to make an all black itch pig hoodie. Yeah, okay. Or I want all the paneling, but I want every single panel gray. I still want the paneling, I want the seams, I want it all, but I want it all one color. And that for me was alarm bells. Like, mm. okay, yeah, we're talking about a ready-made line here. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that that was it. That's it's it's like I think with us because we were doing something that I mean I haven't really seen on 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 on, on a scale like that. Um, there was so many different pathways that were coming out, so many different results. Like you you would see that one that Alex was talking about, where yeah, people would just you know basically make a panel hoodie black, and then you know okay that's the ready-made. But then there was also things like when we did start releasing these these runs of um panel hoods that were not just one of ones it was challenging because you had to make the colorway safe ish so that it would sell to a because if you make it super super crazy you've basically narrowed your audience mm. because only so many people are going to wear something that's you know cyan blue green and black for instance right there's only a certain amount of people that will wear that whereas if you make it black gray with a bit of cyan blue you're opening it up so that was one of the other challenges. We noticed that it was harder to make these crazy colorways that we built the brand on because you couldn't make them at the scale that you wanted to. Right. And it just kind of, it, 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 I guess it presented all these different avenues that, again, we were learning on the fly. Speaking of learning on the fly, how do you two make decisions? Like what's your process? Always have odd numbers in every meeting. Yeah, that's a simple one. That yeah. was a simple one that anyone, whether you're 18 or 30 or 10 year old business or one year old business just have odd numbers in meetings like that. Really yeah simple that's a really really simple one that we probably learned a little bit too late in all honesty because yeah there's been some pretty massive deadlocks between alex and i um headlocks yes. or deadlocks dead well both really <laughs> both. <laughs> yeah i mean avoid stalemates in all meetings so have odd numbers that's a really simple one um keep emotion outside decision making um don't think too long term don't think too short term Think about things in middles. Do you guys have areas of expertise where you give each other the, I guess, upper hand or the control, more of the control? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. I say I say we definitely have our lanes, but because of because of that start period and we built this thing basically ourselves, so much so much of our expertise does overlap. You know, like Alex's Alex's expertise is CD and graph and graphic design, garment design, production, all that stuff. But yet he still calls me over to give him advice and decisions and break a deadlock on uh, something that we're designing or whatever, and vice versa. Like I'll 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 be working on trying to figure out how many how many units we need to alloc- cross, allocate across a whole line for a quarter, and I'll say, well, what do you think about this? Where do you want to put the units? Da da da. It's 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 uh it's hard to describe. It's one of those things where you need to watch it, I guess. Mm. Has there been like one defining sort of deadlock or argument you guys have had that? Maybe it was like a near-death experience for the brand. 
it's all the big ones. It's 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 custom, um, huge one. Changing the, the sizes, factory, massive sizes, another big one. There's been probably maybe a dozen really notable like huge calls. Um, Deciding to bring some stuff in from offshore. Yep, mm, recently. That's the recent one. Yeah, yep. that's yep. the recent one that we've been thinking about for two, three years, and then it finally became. Yep, this needs to happen. Wow, Have talk you us know. through that. Sorry. No, no, yeah, let's, let's hear about that. Yeah, so, I mean, the local manufacturing has sort of gotten to a point where our product architecture is getting so wide that we're starting to produce things that the local makers don't actually want to make. Mm. And You can't just keep making hoodies. That's what he's trying to say. Yeah. You can't just keep making, like, not yeah. that there's anything wrong with making hoodies because everyone has to start somewhere, but after 13 years, it's hard to expect our customers to just keep buying hoodies. Yeah, we've got customers that have got, I mean, the most ridiculous account spends, as you can imagine, <laughs> after 13 years. And they might have 25, 30, 40 hoodies. Wow. Like, we're not talking like 10 hoodies, 5 hoodies. Like, right, we're talking right. like... We've seen collections that like... Multiple, fill, a, fill a bedroom. Yeah. Multiple wardrobes. It's insane. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, we were at 5, 10 hoodie collections at like year 5. And now, like another 5 years on from that. Like So, we've seen some pretty psycho collections of just hoodies. Yeah. So, it's like... As a brand, we need to offer our consumer well, a and much also, wider product offering. Mm. And like to do that, some of these products need to be made offshore. Yeah. And the, the brand was built off, like it was built off, uh, like you said at the start, like it was a unique selling point, And that was, how can we create garments that are manufactured in Australia with our, our taste and flair? And, you know, once you solve the t-shirt and the hoodie and the track pant, then it's like, well, shit, I want to start solving this for golf, for snowboarding, for surfing, for going out on a date, for whatever. For shoes, sneakers. For sh yeah. yeah. So it's like we started just designing stuff and sampling stuff and coming up with ideas and learning, well, how do you, how do you actually make this thing? And then how do we make this in Australia? And then how do we make, I guess, a brand out of it? How do we make money out of it? And it's like that concept got... Yeah, as we as we grow up, because you know, like we're not twenty five year olds anymore, or we weren't twenty two year olds. We started getting older, and we started facing new situations. So we just kept designing to those situations. I, I'm really fascinated about this. Like, what's your take on Melbourne's obsession with hoodies? I mean, are we a big part to play in that obsession? Possibly, <laughs> we could have started um, that. Maybe. maybe who knows? I don't know. I mean, we 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 made the clothes because we couldn't find them. We couldn't. Like we literally couldn't find the clothes that we wanted, so we made them. But I mean, I don't know now. This is a pretty hard Melbourne, topic to talk about, you know. Mm. Yeah, because hoodies are pretty hot, like in Melbourne, definitely. I mean, we've built a brand off hoodies. It's I still mean, be your number one seller. Like. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure, for sure. Yep. Yeah, for seventy percent sure. of our line is fl is fleecy. Wow, every brand yep. I speak to sells hoodies like above all else. Yeah, they have to because that's what the market demands, and it's the easiest thing that's most accessible. Like. Mm. If we well, made hoodies because we were snowboarding, we needed to keep our, keep our necks warm, and we didn't have access to zips, so well, we could make high necks. We only mm. started making zips in 2016 when we had access to hardware. Mm -hmm. So before that, we just made hoodies and had a toggle and a cord so that we could cinch it, mm. so that it would, the hoodie would stay up on our hood. So mm -hmm. while we're snowboarding or skating or playing basketball, we could stay warm. So hoodies for us was a necessity, and it also aligned with our vision of the anonymity of the brand. So mm. balaclava on, hoodie up. No one knows what's going on. So that's why hoodies hoodies were a need for our brand. They weren't necessarily like, I can't even remember if people were wearing hoodies back then. Well, that's what I was about to say is fundamentally like, and I mean, this is a pretty tricky thing to say, but like when we started, hoodies were shit. There were no hoodies that I would wear. Like the only hoodies I would wear were snowboarding, snowboarding hoodies. Like brands like... You know, like, yeah, your basic streetwear brands and snowboarding brands or whatever, right? But, like... Yeah, the hoodies that, like, skate brands were making through early 2000s were, like... It was trash. They were crap stuff. Like, we, we, we were Globe Sale kids, so we grew up going to the Globe Sale in Port Melbourne. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, f spending 50 bucks and getting, like, a whole summer's worth of gear. So that was <laughs> us. Like, but the clothes were trash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, like, when we came back to Australia from Japan at the start there... We were actually, we actually felt like we were creating something that wasn't there. And that was a, a really crazy out there hoodie that was in this unique fit um, in, with this unique, it was completely uni unique. Everything that we did, we felt we were actually putting something new into the world. 
Um, and that's why we did it and that's how we grew. But now, I don't know how to comment on it without being a fucking hater, but you know what I mean? Like, it's like... Uh, that's interesting, man. That's not happening right now, right? People are seeing this brand do it, this brand do it, this brand do it, this brand do it, right? They're all... Yeah. I, 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 I think I'm, I'm, I'm you're trying to say... No, no, you're good. I, I think you're trying good. to say is, is these brands that are popping up now, they're not unique in a way. No. Like, when no. you guys popped up, the panelling, the colours, it was different, right? And today you'll see... 10 brands doing the exact same colors with the exact same types of print with the same, with the same type of print style. Like, and it's like, again, like I'm not going to hate on people getting into the game and having a crack and, and, and trying to do something. But like at the same time, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say they're the same as us. Cause they're not, they're not but, putting something to what's unique. Cause we're like, we come sure. from a product stance. So like, we wanted to make products right. whereas people now are seeing other people's brands and saying, I want a brand. Yes. yes. If you want a brand, yeah, cool, great. Yeah. That's a big difference. Yeah. Big difference. Yeah. I want a brand versus I want to create products. Like we wanted products. We couldn't find the products that we wanted to wear. So, so we, we made them. products. And mm-hmm. then we're like, okay, well, let's call this amalgamation of our two creative pursuits, Itch Pig. Itch being one in Japanese, so we're coming together as one and Pig just being a mindset that we both shared, which was our hunger. And that's that why, what each big was. and that's it why our, our why our why is what it is. Our why is is to create unique ways of independent thinking, right? Start yes. With, start <laughs> with why. Start yeah. with why. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Start with why. Yeah. Whereas I reckon if you asked a whole bunch of other brands what their why is, they would say I wanted a brand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or to make cool products. Yeah. That wasn't what we were after. Or we to make a cool brand, and then just the products are just a reflection of that. Uh, uh, yeah. I yeah. I mean, it's it, like in all honesty, like. Again, I'm not, I don't want to sound like I'm hating, but like, well, it's, it's, it's simply put, you know, like if you're in a position of influence and you've got all these followers, fuck it. Why wouldn't you try and monetize it? I'm not going to hate on someone for doing that. Like that's clever, mm. but that's what they're doing. Yeah. They can't sugarcoat it. It does you know what I mean? saturate a market. I, I know what you're saying. Well, well you, you know, you know, from experience, right? Yeah. Like how different is the market now to when you started push pull? Yeah, I mean, more it's saturated. Different. Like, it, it's funny. I mean, it's almost like you guys started that, like this craze of hoodies, which to be honest, when I asked the question, I didn't even put two and two together. But now that you've voiced that, I'm like, that's pretty undeniable. And then I feel like at Push Pull, we were throwing puff print on the back of hoodies. And I think about 20 brands afterwards, which is puff print, puff print. Everyone's doing it now. Yeah. So There's massive brands that are built off it too. Oops. Heaps. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so I can't believe how many I see. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And I mean, it just shows the need or, or the love of hoodies in Melbourne. And, and I think... Like you guys yeah. have a business because of that, right? Like, yeah. you know, yeah. you guys are now clever and seeing that and capitalizing on it, mm. which is clever. Yeah. Again, it's smart. Yeah. I mean, hopefully for us, we build beyond hoodies, but yeah, I'd be lying to say it's not like a core part of our foundations, right? 100%. You know, we, we are going to build out full product ranges, you know, that are blank that people can utilize. But for now it's starting with hoodies and Yeah, Because it's like, how can you order? Yeah. 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 How can you order a thousand overshirts yeah. or a thousand <laughs> yeah, exactly. sh- yeah. pairs of shorts or, or, yeah. or, 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 you know, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's scary shit. No you, doubt. You're talking about that. Why earlier? I'd love to go deep on this. Obviously you guys, you had three, four years there in the garage probably wasn't sustainable with the operation you guys were running. You had to scale, grow the business, look outside, outsource, all that kind of thing. It was sustainable. Oh, let me stop you there. It was sustainable if we stayed- He's good at that, by the way. Yeah. yeah. No, it's yeah. good. Sorry, like sorry, 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 sorry. Because like, I feel like it's sustainable because I feel like there's a lot of people our age, at our age at that time listening to this podcast, right? It's completely sustainable to- like I could keep, If I had no family- no responsibility and I was still living at home, I could work 16 hours a day, no fucking worries. Yeah, you can stay in mum's garage. Yeah. One or two salaries you'll make. You might make a little bit of profit at the end of it. Maybe you create a different line that does this and that. You you can have a great life. But if you want to build a family, you want to set yourself up, you want to create a team, maybe you want to get this working for like five, six, ten people, Maybe you want to change the industry. You're going to need something a little bit more. Yeah, if you, I mean, if you want to run a business that doesn't run off you, if you want to work outside of the business, like, right. yeah, then you need to scale. Mm-hmm. But if you just want to, if you want to just keep doing what you're doing, then just stay there. Going through that transitory process, was it hard to keep that why, like, tight in terms of, obviously, you started with, you were curating your customers, like, pretty much by message. Mm. And now you've opened it up. Now you've got other people buying your garments. Perception is ultimately going to change. You don't have as much control. 
on who's buying your garments, how you're perceived. How was that navigating that? Well, that's like the growth of a brand, right? Is like at the start you make stuff for you and then it sells to your friends mm. and then it sells to a second wave of friends or a second hub. Now you don't know who you're selling to, but you know through association. Mm. Now you're sort of a brand, a small brand. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you're putting stuff out there and anyone's coming to you. Now you're sort of like, you know, uh, almost a business. Then you employ these people. Now you're a small business and then you're nationwide. And now you're like a decent business. Sure. So it's like to go through all of those growth trajectories, like, I mean, they're crossroads at every single yeah. step of like, do we want to make this commitment? Um, but to be honest, like, like <laughs> to our detriment, like we're pretty, um, how's the word? What's the word I'm looking for? We're pretty, you would say we're stubborn guys. We're pretty like eyes on the prize. You know, like that's where well, the pig, that's the hunger yeah, and the it's brand. Like the, you, know? you know, whatever's yep. in our way, we charge through it despite anything. Like, you know, we've been fired from jobs. We've been like, we've, we've pissed a lot well, of people I off. Had, I haven't had a job. I refused to work for anyone. So I never even did. Well, like, you know, like job. When, 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 when we first started itch pig in Japan or whatever, like when I was snowboard instructing, I would rock up to the lessons just covered in snow because me and him had charged up got on the staff lift and cut lines before the lessons had even started and got freshies. We'd rinse the whole mountain before the mountain even opened. And I would rock up to these lessons covered in like a layer of snow this thick. And my line, my line instructor would look at me and say, mate, what the fuck? And I'm just like, put me on a fucking lesson now. <laughs> and like, and he wouldn't. So then I'd go off and do more snowboarding because that's all I gave a shit about. I didn't care about money. And that concept has repeated over and over again within Itch Pig. To our detriment, you know, and what I'm saying is, is the why of to create unique, uniquely ways of uh, independent thinking. We've applied that concept so gnarly and so hard and fast that it's probably constricted our growth a little bit mm. because we kept fucking rejecting Instagram uh, DMs or, or, or uh, friend requests on Facebook or, or because we came, we kept manufacturing here in Australia or, you know, like, because all these things have consequences. Mm. I want to dive right in on that. I think, you know, with what we've spoken about today and like, you know, you guys had that, the anonymous feel to the brand and all this, like you're knocking back messages. So you're creating this like mountain of like, I would say like hype, right? And like, wow, what is this thing? And then that natural growth and you're talking about the trajectory of brands, which I agree, it's like you're going to scale. And when you scale, you're getting, you know, Joe Blow from down the road who mm. may or may not align with your brand. You don't, we don't know who he is, right? He or she. Um, <laughs> and or them. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. Um, HR's everywhere, bro. Yeah, true. Got to be careful. Um, but where I'm going with this is, I think there was quite a, like this is from my perspective, the brand was so like sought after. And then when it's like out in the masses, it's like, it's always going to have that effect of like the brand's almost done like a flip. You know what I mean? And mm. that, it's like, there's kind of no way around that. It's like you either scale and sell, which is the point of running a business to a degree, or you stay niche within a garage and, you know, you kind of run it in an inefficient sense in a way. Yeah, scale scale was really hard for us and hard for our brand because we wanted to be underground forever mm. and niche forever. And at scale, it's really challenging to do well, that. And, and we wanted to taken, stick to the why. Yeah, it's taken us yeah. so long to actually, I, I mean, for so long we thought our why was to build up the Australian manufacturing industry. Mm. And it's only just the last recent bit we've identified the very early two years of us and the middle period and then this current period we're in now – the only thing that's remained the same is the DIY aspect. And we've come to realize that it's actually doing things ourselves that we like. Yep. And the part of the Australian manufacturing aspect that we like the most is that we were doing it ourselves. It was hands on. Mm. And we can scale that concept into offshore production as well. But the idea of the offshore production is that it's an addition to the brand and an addition to our industry, not a replacement. So nothing that gets made here in bulk will go offshore the hoodies, our crew necks, stuff like that. The stuff that can't get made here, that's going to go offshore and it's going to be an addition to our brand and it's going to allow us to pump more Melbourne-made heritage product through our local industry. Mm. But it's all under the concept of what we've now identified, what our why is, which is just DIY. Yeah. So our new, our new reason for existing is just to be forever DIY. Mm. Yeah, and it's like, you know, like I'm, I keep harping on about this concept of unique ways, unique independent ways of thinking, right? It, it, it's had so many unusual consequences that looking back on it and reflecting it, I don't even know how you foresee this, but I mean like what an obvious one is, is 
this 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 insatiable hunger to stay unique and independent, right? So we've been, you know, basically forcing the, not forcing, but like the makers that make this stuff here in Australia, they actually don't want to make it anymore. They like it's too challenging for them. Yeah, the, the, they just want our fleecy program. Yeah, because mm-hmm. that's like that has the units, yep. like it has the repetition. That's what they want to work on. So when we pull them off our fleecy programs and put them onto some of our new product developments, they're like, ugh, would really rather just be on the fleecy program. Mm. So that's where it's kind of gotten to the point where it's like, okay, rather than continuing to do R&D, teaching our machinists, teaching our cutters how to work on this sort of hard product development, we'll keep them on the fleecy program and then we'll make the other stuff offshore. And that's where I say coming back to top, top level – our decision to be so hard and fast on our initial why has affected the business and mm-hmm. brand in, in so many different ways. It's not even funny. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's an amazing message for, and a lot of our audience is really young, and it's an amazing message for you guys to say, you know, it took us 13 years to fully come up with maybe what our why is, being that DIY element. Obviously, you are you're always got an element of it along the way, but it sounds like it's... It's obviously very translucent in the day to day. Well, the thing for us was like, like it was such a, because of the time, literally when we started in 2010, it wasn't as easy and as obvious on how to monetize these things. I.e. Shopify is not around, Mm. you know, Instagram paid ads, all this stuff that everyone now knows how to do to make like, you know, you get a following, you make a product, you drop it with a CTA on your story, you send them to the Shopify website that you've built and you sell X amount of units. Yeah, that process didn't exist. That didn't exist. Mm. That mm. was not around. It's like big cartel or like some... Yeah, 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 big cartel. And well, they were, or Facebook order forms. We'd make order forms. <laughs> yeah. People would fill out order forms, send them back to us and we'd produce the garment, Where send them a bank transfer. Like, And that's, <clears> the, <throat> that's again what I, I keep coming back to is that because we were literally doing things our way on our terms... Every decision, everything, everything we like, just simply everything we had to design and think of a process for it. Because yeah, like Alex is right. I remember those fucking order forms. Yeah. We would send people these order forms <laughs> over Facebook. They'd fill out their name. Like I, yeah. we we designed the order form in, in in Illustrator. You fill out, you know, what type of garment you want. What are the colors? And, and that's send it back. That's and then they bank transfer us. As our why is the DIY mm. that came our why. Yeah. And it's taken us so long to realize. Hang on bolstering up the Australian manufacturing industry. That's not our why. That's just something that we, has has happened from how gnarly we are about doing things ourselves. And that can be scaled anywhere. There's a, there's a tradition we have on this podcast that we speak with guests and we haven't had anyone that's been around in this game for 13 years. So I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on this question. It's a bit of a taboo one, I think, in Australian culture. Not many people talk about financially, you know, how, how they're tracking. Um, but I think for our young audience, I think it's really important that they know if they were if they were able to be in the game for ten years, thirteen years, where they might end up. So mm. if you guys don't mind me asking, how are you guys travelling financially? Fine. I mean, we've got a team. We've got a we've huge got fucking warehouse. kids. We have kids. <laughs> we have a family. We drive cars. We have houses, like phones. Um, yeah, all the base like business expense covers life. Um, we work fucking hard for it though. Yeah, we don't get really it, hard. Don't get us wrong. We work. We work like we yeah. we we worked while people were sleeping for ten years. Yeah, I don't know if the younger consumer or the younger brand builder understands the sacrifice, but I mean, we gave up our twenties. I mean, mm. I haven't drank alcohol for seven years. Like we, um, yeah, I could, we've I, given yeah. up a lot. We've given up a lot and sacrificed a lot for this brand. Um, but the rewards are there. Um, it just takes a decade. That's all. Mm. How much? How much do you guys have to turn over a year? to i guess operate like eight people in the team a warehouse different stores i mean um, our warehouse our, our latest warehouse in brunswick is a pretty heavy wicket um, yeah it's just off ligon it's huge it has officing warehousing it has a skate park a basketball ring shop front four car parks like in brunswick so you can imagine what that costs yeah i mean there's basic rules that you, you follow but again it's like i guess for us being in business now for 13 years, you realize that there's not one hard and fast way. Like there are so many other brands that are, you know, out there doing it or whatever that have just a different, you know, if your revenue is say, say your revenue is a hundred grand a month, right? 
there will be brands that spend 20% on advertising. There'll be brands that spend 10%. There'll be brands that spend 30%, right? And it's just about finding out what works for you. Um, that's, that's the best way I'd describe it. We chose to have, you know, a really, really cool space that's, you know, close to the CBD that probably no other brand in Australia has. Mm-hmm. No one, no, I can't think of another brand that probably has our space. Yeah, when we left Tot- the Tottenham factory, which was the first factory in the West, we were like, should we split our operations? Should our large space warehousing be sort of out in the sticks? And then should we have like a really nice office in like Paran or something like that? And at that point, we we're thinking about that sort of concept, but then we just said, no, nah, everything needs to be in-house mm-hmm. Again, because of the DIY aspect, right? Every single crossroad, we've always leaned towards the DIY decision. We like, built a skate park because we want. I wanted to build a skate park. So I literally, we found a factory and I built a fucking skate park. I'm not a yeah. carpenter. I'm a hack. But I literally <laughs> built yeah. a skate park. So we're like, should we pick our location to be near a skate park? And we're like, no, let's make our own. <clears> so it just f- keeps falling back to that DIY, which is why we know that's the why of the brand. And and, so. and for the, for, and for the, for the, you know, we just completely dodged your question in yeah, a clever yeah. way that business owners will always do. <laughs> so uh, I kind of suspected it. I was, yeah. I was actually going to triple down and try to get a number. You out can go as many as you want. You can try as many as you go. We'll keep giving value. Yeah, yeah. We'll keep giving value answers. The great but value it won't answers. be the answer you want. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, give me this one. What was your best month maybe? And what was the product or the drop over the 13 years? And maybe a ballpark figure. You can even go units if you want to yeah, yeah. units. Well, for instance, Saint Side, that last collab we did with Saint Side, that was that pretty. Was that was pretty amazing. Moving, what was it? Four, five, five hundred units. Mm-hmm. Five hundred units in about twenty four hours on Black Friday weekend, not on sale, and people were voting and at in, the time. And in Saint Albans, and in Saint Albans, in a physical, we didn't physical space. Yeah, yeah, physical space, physical 200 space. people wrapped around a line in the middle of fuck nowhere. You guys seriously yeah. would not know where the hell it is. You uh, guys would never have been there in your lives. I heard about that store. That's where they sold like the Supreme out of no, isn't that, that the OG? The OG, that's yeah. Where, like, yeah. yeah. Bike, yeah. Bike, bike culture shop. Yeah. But yeah, like, like yeah, we had we had a line there on, yeah, it was, it was voting weekend. It was Black Friday. There was lots of other brands having huge sales and we were selling $220 hoods. Yeah, full price, no no discount, no whatsoever, and it sold out in twenty four hours. Like, but even some of the old days with like you know even the very first all black hoodie, like you know you're doing five figure nights in two thousand and fourteen. That's like, like a, that's like a seven figure night now with the inflation. Exactly, with inflation, <laughs> it's worth a lot. So like, coffee's expensive. The thing yeah, I want to double doing down. big. Yeah, we've been doing big release nights since like twenty, probably fourteen, fifteen. Yeah, so, I mean, from 16, 17 onwards, once we moved into the space, it's been pretty big Bloody release yeah. nights. But, I mean, we're much more about, like, the consistency. Like, yeah. we don't have dips. Like, every single day we're selling, every day we're packing orders, mm. every day we have people on dispatch, every day we're selling. There's not really, like, you know, now it's much more about sort of one drop a month with most brands. It's sort of about build the hype and then release. Whereas we're much more um, steady and stable. Yep. Um, that's sort of our more approach. Yeah. Cool. We don't love the whole hype driven mm. um, thing. Yeah. But like, I mean, to kind of come back to the person that's listening to this and give a bit more value. I always say success is not money. It's happiness, enjoyment. If you achieve those things, money will come. And I'm going to be straight and blunt. For the first four or five years, we didn't make nothing. We was, we, you know, like we li- literally did not take any money out of the business. And that's what I don't think today's um, people are willing to do. Nah, they don't get yeah. it. Because they see, they see these influencers just go whack. Yeah. And they go, they, and they just, you know, suddenly they've got this brand overnight or all these, these, yeah, there's just all these brands that are just coming out of nowhere. They're exploding because of TikToks and all that stuff, right? Mm. Um, can I double down that for a sec, Nate? I think... On that point, it's like the longer you can wait out, in my experience, for you guys it was four or five years and you've been around for 13. And I think there's I think there's a link there. You know, for me, at Pushwell, we did vintage like a year, year and a half. Didn't make a dollar, but like we're meeting people, we're building this thing. Mm. You know, that brand's still going strong. The longer you take to like build the foundations properly and not just cash out. Because when you cash out within six months or something to make mm. a wage or something, you're, you're cutting a corner, essentially. Mm. Essentially, you, you will yeah. in some which way. Because unless it's one of your... Unless it's your second or third business and you understand that business in and out, 90% of people, shit, hit my face on the mic, 90% of people haven't run that business before. So they, they're seeing that cash arise and they're just grabbing it. Well, yeah. that's the thing. It's like these, these, um, 
how do I say it? One of the biggest things that we learned was as we built a brand for the first four or five years, we then have spent the rest of the time learning how to build a business. There's a very very different, big difference between a, a business and a brand. Yeah, we talk about brand in business a lot at work. There's decisions that are favorable for brand, decisions that are favorable for business, and it needs to balance out. Mm. If you make too many great decisions for business, your brand's going to go down the toilet. And if you make too many great decisions for your brand, you're not going to have a business. And again, the problem, one of the one of our biggest challenges, and and you know, it's been amazing having this learning, is that that why that we initially put in place had such an effect on our brand because the economics of that decision, i.e. making 95% of our, our line here on this shore at that volume and width, what that does to your business as a margin game is seriously challenging. Yeah. 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 Seriously challenging. Yeah, like, the margin's been hard for 13 years. Like it's been a tricky margin to navigate, but we're really proud of what we've done with like the local 100%. industry and what we've like pumped up for yeah. them. Like, you know, we started with a sewers that maybe 10, 15 um, machinists and now they have like 50 yeah yeah, yeah, yeah we've been their number one contract for over a decade that's cool yeah it's crazy we would like without sounding like a wanker which i'm about to is like we've done something that we no one else has done mm. i don't think like no one's gotten to this width and and scale while still producing here and 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 sticking to the things that we've been sticking to it's 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 nuts that we've made it work mm. but it has it has had some challenges along the way like i'm sure you know jesse like there was a stigma about us, you know, messaging people on Facebook at one stage. That was something that we had to do to make it work. Because, mm. you know, everyone's going to buy your first couple of drops. You're like, you're new, you're fresh. But what happens when you're in year six? Mm. How do you keep in people's faces? Like there's mm. all this competition, there's new brands, there's Facebook algorithm changes, yep, you know, like yep, yep, yep. you have to fucking start direct messaging people. And uh, after, after a while, you know, I was the one that was doing that and people would start turning around and say, you know, what the fuck is this guy doing? Every time he talks to me, he just t- tries to take money off me. And it's just like, it's how do you explain to them in that moment? Oh, you know, we're just 25 year olds trying to make a go of this. We're trying to keep things in Australia. We're trying to keep all the money that you spend is in Australia. Um, and we're trying to do it our own way. You can't, you can't say that to someone. Mm. You don't have the time. Yeah, it's interesting. I, and to be honest, yeah, I've heard that a little bit and I, I, it's just got coming full circle. Um, you know how you're like, oh, earlier in the potty, you were like, I don't, we didn't accept everyone on Facebook. I'm pretty sure I was one of those ones at the X. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, nah, man, I, w- yeah. I would have accepted you. No stress, no stress. So you might have been pretty young then though. So yeah, I, I was. was I, I was, was pretty ruthless for 13 year olds. Yeah, we'd have like a fucking Steve Nash DP or something. Yeah, fuck this guy. Yeah, but <laughs> Um, I just had to get that in there real quick. But I think, you know, with like this journey of 13 years, there's so much to talk about. And, you know, I think I, I know when I was going out, you know, into nightclubs and this and that, the brand, I saw a lot on like people that were out in that club to like close till the sunrise would come up. And I'm, you know, I was like, shit, that wasn't really the association or the DNA of the brand. Um, Fuck no, it wasn't. So like, how we're, not guys, the, we're not for those people. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you haven't drunk in seven years. It doesn't seem like you'd be at those nightclubs. Like, what? What? How have you navigated that? Um, yeah, it was interesting. I mean, hustle was such a big part of the brand, and that came through the hunger and the pig aspect. And so there were so many times when that hustle culture would sort of get flipped into like a nasty direction mm. and a direction that we weren't really that proud of. And the brand and the product, mainly the product just sort of filtered into sort of little micro groups and micro subcultures that we weren't necessarily a part of. And, and it's hard to be everywhere. We're like we were running a fucking business. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we, we, you know, we were going snowboarding, playing basketball at MSAC and that's where we were seeing the brand, yep. you know, skating and whatnot. That's where we were seeing the brand. But then little did we know that under the surface, there was this sort of thing growing and brewing and it took so long for us to see that and we're like, oh, wow, this thing's really turned into a thing. And then we had to pretty much cut our arm off. And Which was custom. Change. Custom was the thing that we cut off. We, we got sure. rid of the tall fits and we got rid of custom. We yeah, just and some of the sliced. colorways as well. We had to change the colorways. Yeah. yeah, we saw it with like our, our, our staff. Yeah, our that staff, was 2015, 2016. Yeah. Do you know, you remember, do you yeah. know Christian Fafala and stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they were working for us at the time. And uh, what was Jace, what's Jace's last name? Anyway, I can't remember. Yeah, a lot of our young retail staff that were doing our retail, our dispatch, they were in that scene. And they were like, hey, guys, like, I know you're not in this scene, but this is happening. And we were like, no, nah, no, nah, it's chill. We're playing basketball. We're snowboarding. We're skating. We're, we're fine. All good. But On then they were like, no, 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 it's happening. So we kind of then identified it and we're like, okay, 
this is a problem. This is not the direction the brand and its products are supposed to be going. What products are they all buying? They're all buying the same products. Done. Get rid wow. of it. And it was like, it was like, like, <sighs> I'm going to co- contradict everything I just said about, you know, don't worry about money and all that stuff that we said, right? But that happened in year five. It started in year five, got really accelerated in six, and by seven, it was rampant. Those were the three years we started fucking paying ourselves. Mm. So it's like- What do you do? I know. We're, pressure now. We're, yeah, finally, yeah. We're, finally, we're finally making some money. We're finally breathing. We're fu- like, like- <laughs> well, we, we had to, a team, we had a warehouse, we had stock lines, we had manufacturers that were supporting on us for indent orders every single month. Yeah. And then we're like, hang on, everything that's supporting that is this direction of the brand we don't actually like. But you like you it's get to those crossroads and if you're thinking long term, you have to make that decision. Like yeah. to paint the picture of the kind of people we were between year one and four, we would go to the snow and we would stand by the bins in the restaurant wait for people to bring up their trays of food and say, are you finished with that? And they would say, they wouldn't know what to say. You pretend to be the busboy, take it off them and you'd go eat it. That's the kind of people we were. That's how, that, those are the kind of decisions we had to make to just keep the brand going. You see why I join in on podcasts now? Because if he just went to podcasts by himself... You it would get pretty loose. The shit that <laughs> I mean, come out there's, of some, now. there's been some pretty fucking loose things. That I, we've done. I, I love like the hustle culture of you guys. Thirteen years in, and then you're telling us before we went on air that like you're buying like the servo coffees for staff. Like you're still like just your mindset's very like you guys aren't going off with the wind. Like oh, you know. We're fucking a big brand. Everyone knows we it. We can't. No, because well, it's Every not day's our day interest. One, that's what you say. It's Every not day's our day one. It's not, and our, it's not our interest. Well, mm. I don't. I don't want to drive a Lamborghini. Like I'd rather plug that money into a new product category. Yeah. Like I'd rather learn. Like we could have made a puffer jacket six or seven years ago, for instance. I wish you did. There's so many fucking North Face cats. Sure, exactly. Oh, like, tell me about the green lining. Yeah. I've been designing yeah. puffer jackets. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, sorry, line, sorry yeah. to everyone fucking wearing cat man, dude. Yeah, yeah, fuck yeah, me. Yeah. I, I apologize, I apologize. Yeah. They're probably taking him off right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking lighting him on fire. <laughs> but like, we've been designing puffer jackets in our head and in our sketchbooks for like the better part of half a decade. Mm. But until we know everything about it, we're not going to make one mm. because we're so obsessed with product that if we're not creating something that either isn't there or is bettering something that previously was there, there's no point making it. So for us, because we're such product heads, it's like I don't want to spend all of that potential money that I could invest into puffer jacket research on a Lamborghini. Not even So I that. can drive around and be cool. I've got a wife and a kid like, yeah. well, we and don't, a dog we, yeah. I really like. We've never been like that. We don't get value out of having a, he- a heavy watch. or a, It's just not what we're about. We're about... I don't know. Yeah, it's just not what we're about. Like, and 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 to prove that, like, we could have sent all our manufacturing offshore For sure. five times over by now, and we could have been plugging that money into Lambos and stuff. But we decided <laughs> not to, and keep it here. And you know, we, we we've you know we've sacrificed a shitload of mm. money for that. For sure, I, I know I've banged on the thirteen years, but I think coming to you know today, and we're in the midst of like this TikTok craze, like brands are I'm speaking to brands that have been out for 12 months making like six, seven figures. Like this is a very different time to the Facebook order forms. Um, and I know you guys have had to adapt and roll. What are some of those drastic changes you've had to make and to stay relevant? Are you hiring young people? What are you doing? I suppose it's, yeah, hiring young for sure. Um, identifying what you're not great at. And finding people that are better than you at that. That's what, really important. What is that? Marketing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're so obsessed with product <laughs> that we just, at every free stage of any day, we spend it designing product. Well, and, and to, wow. be, to be fair, like, I would always say, we've always been the person that's just out there doing it. Like, you know, like... Yeah, we're never the capturer. We're you the don't one. like to speak about it and... No, push on we're not, the, like we're not the person go, that goes yeah. and does... Like, yeah, if you go on my Instagram, like... Uh, it's like, yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of skate clips, but that's just to document some of the things that I've achieved that I never thought I would achieve while skateboarding. It's not because I fucking want everyone to see it. Look at me, yeah. yeah. And yeah. our younger, it goes back to when we were filtering, the brand was filtering through that audience. We didn't, ne- weren't necessarily um, trying to target. It was our younger crew that were telling us like, hey, this is happening because we weren't out there. Mm. We were off skating and playing basketball and snowboarding. Like we were busy doing. And so- we've never really been behind the camera documenting. 
Th- and that's yeah. the shift, isn't it? Like nowadays yeah. I would say documenting and showing what the brand's doing kind of every fucking second of the day. The world's changed a little bit. It's that, just, it has, it has. The it's world's changed. It's, it's different. I, I just hope that change isn't at the detriment of product and things that we actually yeah. use in our day-to-day life. Yeah. I don't want the ergonomics and the ability of product to sustain everyone's lives to dip yeah. all because of just an image of marketing. Um, yep. That's what my personal concern of is being in a goods industry. Are the value of goods actually going to dip because yep. everyone just cares about the perceived value? Well, and I'm going to step in and say what he's trying to say, and that's the value of goods has dipped. Yeah, Sim- fundamentally, like okay. like you said, like every like it's it's obvious. Like if everyone's putting out the same product, no one's thinking S- uniquely and, and changing the needle. Everyone's just trying to make a buck, make six, seven figures, eight figures, whatever. Cash right? out, yeah, yeah and cashing out, and it's like it's really hard for us because we didn't grow up like that. We're not like that. But then it's like, it's, it's what the times are. So it's yeah. like, it's this constant, um, yeah. this you internal struggle. Wages. You got like, you guys have got responsibilities now that you Absolutely. have to, so yeah, there's, yeah. there's a level of trade off there. That yeah. you and you can't just like hard out stick to your why, yeah. because if you, if we keep sticking to that, why, well then we won't be able to go to year 14. Yeah. It's, that's simple. It's, when it's did you guys first show your faces in the brand? Oh, you five Ages. or six, yeah, yeah. Oh, even, even in the second factory, which was in Tottenham, it was very rare. It, we still made sure it had a roller door because then you could still bang on a roller door. So you'd then be opening a roller door 2015, 2016, still wearing yeah balaclavas on wow. the factory. Because we simply just don't give a fuck. We don't care about it. Like we just, I, I don't know how else to say it. It's yeah, just the not only us. thing we've ever given a fuck about is product. Yeah, yep. product. Yeah, anything outside of product, we were like, don't care. It's refreshing to hear this. It like is. We, we've <laughs> yeah. sat down with so many brands and not to shit on any of them that have been on here, but ones that we spoke to off air. It's just like... Unfollow. Yeah, bang. <laughs> the like, nah, whole podcast gone to shit now. Hey, nah, don't worry. I've just spent the last hour, hour shitting on a whole bunch as well. So <laughs> yeah, that's we're good. in the same boat. <laughs> this is what we do. We just shit on everything. I was <laughs> stoked about You'll me. you see me shaking my head a lot <laughs> in the podcast. <laughs> it's good. The old need to uh, you know, give to the brother. Yeah, I don't name. like how far away we are because <laughs> even though I have long legs, I still can't <laughs> punch my the table. No. Camera's from the, the waist up, so you're all good. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I say the word refreshing because I think, you know, we, we come on here and, and to, be, to be honest, like marketing is a skill and, you know, I'll stand up for marketing because that's like my strength, right? So it's funny. I look at you guys. I'm like, Fuck, I don't really know the first thing about product, but I, I know how to just like sell a story, you know? And so we're very different in that sense, but I love hearing the, up, the opposite side. Mm. Um, and I, I see, you know, the saturation involved. I, I think TikTok is at the epitome of that it's teaching people that you have to be fast you have to do this yeah. you have to cash Super out you have to, do this. you have to do all these things that it's like and like it's uh, and, and we're starting to go off that slappy happy fucking kind <laughs> of uh, kind of psycho- psychology thing about it but it's like yeah i just see so many people and i, I feel it i feel it in me sometimes like I, I i look at other things and i just think oh fuck I'm, i should be doing this i should be yeah. doing that and it's like nah you should just be fucking enjoying it like, yeah. like you're enough like the what like if you guys love product you shouldn't need to change and that mm-hmm. like i'm glad that you guys are like coming on here and and making a bit of an effort to tell that story because what's sad about today is people forget that you guys love product because you you know what i mean like that's where you're putting your time and effort mm. so then people just look at the brand that's in their face on on tiktok yeah and that's where they're getting consumed mm. yeah but it's like here's you guys fucking building the next best puffer jacket or whatever mm. but no one gives a fuck because they're there on tiktok mm. glued in and that's what we're working towards at the moment is we're only now just starting to build out a marketing team mm. that will be able to tell those brand rich stories about us yep because for so long we've just built out product teams and we've built out dispatch teams to get all of those orders out because the product's been so hot. It's only now that we're sort of like, okay, let's actually build a marketing team that can document this story and tell brand rich stories. Because, you know, if you like, you know, you guys hit us up and said, oh, um, let's do a podcast. We'll happily sit here and tell the story, but not, we're not going to walk up to you on the street, tap you on the show. Hey, have you heard about each pig? Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, we don't care because we're saying, hey, like I'm making a cool... Like when someone asks me, what have you been up to? I talk about the product I'm designing. I don't talk about the brand. Yeah. I talk about, oh, I'm working on a puff jacket. I have been for six years. Well, and also <laughs> we don't go out of our way to do gimmicks to get attention, to bring attention onto ourselves. We're just not those people. Yeah. We're just not. Like, yeah, we're not flashy guys. We're not flashy guys. Like we're... Like if you come to the basketball court and you, 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 you'll, you'll see what we're about because mm. we'll be the guy that, you know, yeah, we'll play fucking until 10 o'clock at night or whatever. But like... That's it's it's we're we're, we're like doing things we're yeah. doers yeah and so doers I'll, I'll, do, doers often oftenly not they're not good marketers they're not capturers right 
Yeah, and, and like it's a sort of old fashioned sensibility. You guys aren't old, but like the mo- the world's moving so fast. Like I'm 25, 26. Like I'm starting to feel like fuck. I'm really out of touch. I reckon 21 year olds are almost out of touch. I know, mm. and it's like it's mm. it, and that's and that's it actually happens to us at, at, at work. It's like like the, the, our young people at work. Shout out to Marcus and Jasper. Like because I said I'd, I'd give them a shout out. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, like they say those things to me at times. Like you can see it. Like it's moving too fast for them. And it's just like, oh, what? it's, it's mm. off the back of that. When you get hit up by a young kid asking, what do I do? How do I start a brand? I'd love to get your take on that because obviously most people today would just say, oh, you know, social media is everything, get on TikTok. Like, but I, I'm assuming that you would have a very different approach to what you tell someone. Mm. So I'd, I'd say research. Yeah. Yep, that's exactly what we both say because like it's, it's simple. It's as simple as, as when we started this thing, we didn't have a brand to go hit up and say, hey, how do you start a brand? Mm. So it's like, what happens if, if Itch Pig's no longer around? What's that kid going to do then? He can't mm. keep just, like if I just, if we just keep feeding him answers, we mm. become his mm. drug. He just keeps hitting us. You know? Yeah, I'd be saying research. I mean, if you want to like make a video game, go sit in an arcade every single night. If you want to make a clothing brand, go sit at a fabric wholesaler every single day and sweat the sales person over fabrics. Um, if you want to make... I don't know if you want to be in food or something, find a restaurant and go there every single day. And that's your R&D. And, uh, and ask, mm. ask for an apprenticeship. Be, go be a dish pig. Mm. You know, we were fucking sewers. Like we were literally butchers. Yeah, we wanted to make clothes. So we got a sewing machine and, and started making clothes. Like it, it's just R&D. I wouldn't be le- going on social media. I don't know. That, I, no, I personally wouldn't. Yeah. Because you're going to be learning someone else's way. of doing way. Yeah. Learn your way. This is R and D. This is the problem with society uh, and within clothes. I mean, Here we go. We, 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 we I feel like you, I feel like you two could. Um, <laughs> yeah. we'll, 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 have have our, we'll have our own episode after this. But <laughs> yeah. No, I think I went broad then, but to come narrow, like with the clothing industry specifically, like people would rather jump on TikTok and write like how to start a clothing brand and hear from some guys probably never run a brand go, these are the three things you need to do, you know, make this, do that. Where I love your approach. It's like, go get your hands dirty and yeah. go and meet people and go shake fucking hands. Mm. It's very long term. Mm. That's why you guys have been around for 13 years. You yeah, it is. It, it is. And it'd be interesting to see if those other, I mean, and we're not sitting here saying the way we've done it is the right way. There's, you know, TikTok brands or whatever, like they might last 13 years as well. Who knows? Like, I'm yeah, not this was the right way for back then mm. was, you know, we still say the phrase get in the mud. We still say that at the office yep. every single day because pigs like get in the mud. We like being in the mud. We like being on all fours. We like getting dirty. So we still do after 13 years. Like if I have a week where I feel like I haven't been in the mud, like that won't be a very enjoyable week for me. Like I want to get dirty, touch and feel some fabrics see some production faults yeah. that I have to fix. Like, yeah. Back I to like the basics. that. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where's the brand go from here, guys? Well, it's crazy. We've got so many like opportunities coming our way at the moment. It's, mm. it's nuts. It's like we, we've, uh, we t- footwear opportunities, brand to brand collaboration opportunities. We're still working with a lot of local artists. We still try to work with an, a local artist once a quarter. Yep. Um, there's a really sick collab coming at the end of this month. Um, other brands we want to work on as well. There's about two or three other brands we want to start. Mm, see. So putting wow. feelers out there to other people, if you want to work with us, I don't know where the cameras are. But <laughs> <laughs> if you want to um, work on a new brand with us, we've got two brands pretty much ready to go and a third one we're keen on as well. Well, and it's also trying to, trying to one of the, one of the, the, the challenging things that we've realized is, you know, and we didn't see this coming was when we were in your position, we didn't realize what having a partner, what having a kid meant in terms of time, you know, like there's so many things that you want to give your absolute all to, but there's not enough hours in the day. Like, like I said, I worked, I worked till 10 o'clock last night and I was basically out the door by six thirty this morning, you know, and it, I'm still not going to get everything done. I'm still behind and that's okay. But like, it teaches you that like the hard part for us now is, is that we want to try and get each pig running by itself a little bit more without, you know, just huge volumes from us, mm-hmm. which it's getting to and getting there um, so that we can start doing these other ideas that we have because we can't create time. You've got to free time up. For sure. Can, can we talk about any of those collaborations or are they, are they, are they waiting to be unveiled? Um, yeah, there's one. The one at the end of this month, we can't. It's a local sculptor, um, just had a recent, um, uh, wasn't a pop-up, recent gallery um, exhibition. Very cool. Um, another one in Q3 with a local artist that has a residency in the city. 
which would be really cool. Brand to brand one in November. We can talk about that. Um, we? Oh yeah, we'd, well, Saint Sides becoming an annual collaboration. Oh, cool. Yeah, two um, two business local businesses coming together around Black Friday um, to support you, um, like art, to support that, both yeah. businesses and say a bit of a fuck you to Black Friday. Yep. Um, and put a lid on sort of mass consumerism. Yeah. So we're doing that in November as well. Um, yeah, it's a graffiti artist that we're working with as well for another. Yeah, um, collaboration, massive. graffiti, and then those. footwear, sort of in the in the discussions as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to ask that those other brands you speak about are they all within clothing, footwear, or are they? Um, some are in some are in clothing, skincare. No, no, there isn't. Fuck, cross. <laughs> Jesus, Wait, look, Nate was on the TikToks there. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, there's some food stuff, but look it's at my skin. For, I know nothing about mainly skin for events and stuff. Cool. Yeah, not really a direct brand to brand. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we try to do um, an artist and or brand to brand every quarter. Yeah. And yeah, all long term plays really. Yeah. It's exciting, guys. I mean, yeah, yeah. There's so much going on. It's, yeah. it's berserk. It's so fun. Like we're learning. We're learning so much shit every day. Um, yeah. It's wild. People, uh, people would be pretty amazed. They, you know, like people have this uh, probably impression of us that we're earning these crazy amounts of money and just living on yachts and stuff. That's just not realistic. Yeah. It's just not how it goes. You guys are in the mud, by, by, and yeah, where we want to be, yeah, yeah, where you want to be. Yeah. The um, oh, on that note, I was going to say, I think what I tell myself when I you know work similar to you guys, so like big days and this and that. I say it's. To myself, this is the hardest thing I've ever done, but like that's why I love doing it. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, I know you love your weight training, and I'm mm. sure you love a lot of like the skating and like putting yourself into like these uncomfortable situations. But you wouldn't have it any other way. Mm. No, nah. we thrive under it. That's like, I mean, you know, pressure makes diamonds. We say that at work a lot, and I mean, I I love it. I, I, like I love the pressure. I love the feeling of it. I like getting in a hole, figuring out how to climb out. I like people pulling the ladder on me. Like, I love that shit. There's a lot of that in this industry. <laughs> yeah, there is. I mean, people that don't understand the rag trade, they just see the glitz and the glamour. And, of course, mm-hmm. now through screens, you just see what happens on the screen. Mm-hmm. But, you know, behind that, there's a production manager that's, like, stressed to their eyeballs. Or there's a designer that just can't figure out their way through a zip construction or a pocket construction. Or there's a dispatch person with 10,000 orders and it's Friday. Yep. Like, that's what runs this industry. Yep. And... We love being those people in the industry. What about your family commitments? Like how, as you were just touching on, like is is that one of the hardest things that you've just got to, you know, you got a young family, you got to be there for your, your kids. How does that go? Uh, that's been a truly uh, confronting experience for me personally. Um, I really took for granted being your, your guy's age and just like literally having the ability to do 16 hour days. Like I took for granted. Um, and that's what I would say is enjoy them because they don't last forever. They and use them. Don't drink them at the bar. Yeah. Or if you're drinking up at the bar, make sure that you're... Drinking with the right people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I don't drink because I drank. Don't worry about that. Right. Like yeah. I did some drinking, you know. You don't know Williamstown, but anyone that does know Williamstown... Uh, I do now. <laughs> ...knows that I the have trigger. done some drinking. <laughs> yes, correct. Trigger. I've done some nice. drinking. Yeah, I don't so like... like you know, if you're drinking or if you're like partying or if, you know, just make sure it's getting somewhere, man, because yeah. you're going to blink and, you know, you're just going to be like, fuck, I could have used those hours better. Don't waste them. And it's not, it's not like, cause I mean, it's not to p- paint it like we're washed and we're kind of out of the scene and stuff and we're like sitting here regretting it. The, the problem is, is like your kid comes along and you fucking love it. Yeah. It's yeah, fun yeah. as yeah. like, yeah. as much as I enjoy being in the mud with the business, I love hanging out with my kid. Like you love it more. One. It's the yeah. best thing that there yeah. is. And the challenge, the challenging thing is, is that you realize like simple things, like every single thing you do is simple and fun. Like, like going and hanging out with, with my son and watching documentaries all weekend literally that's all we did we just watched we binged planet earth our planet animals all of them (laughs) we went through all of them it was sick i loved it but it's like i wouldn't give up that time and i can't give up that time but then how do you put that that time the business needs Mm. and it's like it's it's really challenging you're fighting this internal struggle between you know what the business needs but you've got this living thing that needs it as well well i suppose that's the reward of getting to where you are though with 13 years that you've put in now you've got far more leverage than you did 
yeah. year one or two. Mm. Yeah. And you know, you have the expertise, you have the skills, you know the people. And so that's why we're sitting here being like, we can start a new brand and yeah. jump start straight to year 10. Like if we started a new brand tomorrow, like where it would start compared to itch big, it's just like, <laughs> it's, mi- it's absolutely mind boggling. Yeah. Yep. yeah mind boggling. Yeah. How much, how much stuff and how many things we had to overcome that, you know, even bef- even when you take off the first couple of things of, you know, Shopify is now around, you can directly link your Facebook and Instagram, TikToks to your website. You know, there's, there's these huge followings, all that kind of stuff. Like that wasn't around at all. We had to figure that out. Mm. But even like just all the learnings, like, mm. yeah, it's crazy. It's insane. Success has a lot of different definitions. But to me, like that's how I think I know you guys have made it. I know it's a really shitty term, but... I think because of those learnings and to know that you could start itch big tomorrow, you know, fill in the blank with what the new name would be, but to know that you're light years ahead of where you were, that means to me that you've made it. Yeah. It's just getting better every day. And if you do that every single day, you don't skip a day, you do it for 13 years, you're going to be, you know, probably where you want it to be 13 years ago. And I think that's all we've done is just like a pig. We've chewed through blood, bone and everything in between. Yeah, thirteen years, one percent better every day, or probably point yeah. zero one percent better every day. Yeah, really. Like, not, and that's the realistic thing that people listening to this podcast need to understand is, is unfortunately, not everyone gets to grow ten percent every day. Like some, some do. That's just not how it is. And, and I think if you do, there's like it's like everything in life equal opposite reaction. It's it's turbulent when you grow on ten percent a day. You, yep. You're under the pressure to make big fucking mm. decisions. Mm. Where if you do just grow a little bit per day, you can just gradually build mm. nicely, progressively, and. With some longevity. Yeah, mm. we've had the periods where, I mean, COVID was just mental. Oh, like man. 10X, the business 10 x in wow. two years. So we've had those periods and like knowing when you need to put a lid on stuff is like if that grow, if, if that explosion of the brand happened to us in year one, we wouldn't have known what to do with it. I'm yeah. just so we didn't know what, We didn't know what to do with it then. Yeah. Like looking back on that, we learned so much stuff through that. Like that was insane. Mm. That was just nuts. I was very thankful it happened at a period where we were like – Quite somewhat ready somewhat established yeah. and ready for it yeah. yeah and even then we still made huge like i'm i'm now i'm you know one of my new exciting challenges is i'm learning about how our finance and and, and all all the flow of product and bills and stuff flow into our our business i'm now learning how that's all and i'm looking at what i did to our business in covid <laughs> and it's just like <laughs> oh such a headache i've yeah. created so many problems and so many messes because we would just go you know, just do it, whatever. Fuck it. Press the green button. Yeah, just, <laughs> just keep doing, just keep doing. And it's yeah. like, it's crazy. It's crazy. Guys. Yeah. The learnings we've taken today, Jack and I sometimes feel a bit selfish when we get brands that have been around for so long on here. <laughs> we take too many notes mentally. So guys, it's been bloody refreshing and cool. I really mean it. Like I started the podcast with a little you know, story about how you guys sparked that sort of fire within me, within streetwear. And yeah, there's not many brands in Melbourne and in Australia that have done what you've done. So from the bottom of my heart, I really appreciate you guys. All right. Thank Lots you. Respect, guys. Appreciate Thanks you for having us. On. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you.